since the beginning of markets, people have accumulated wealth by investing, putting their money away early and not touching it. Literally all you have to do and you will be rich, period, right? And most people who have gotten rich over time in markets have never looked at a chart. They don't even know technical analysis exists. They've probably never made a trade. What they've done is that early in their life, they've put money away and they've had the you know, discipline to not touch it. And then they've touched it when they were older and they've gotten rich. More and more people are buying and holding Bitcoin. 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 Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Some call this digital gold. Everybody should probably have 1% of their assets in Bitcoin. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest, Scott Melker, the wolf of all streets, one of the most respected crypto Twitter traders in this space, will give you tons of awesome insights on trading, on investing, on crypto as a new asset class. Scott, so excited to have you on the show. How are you doing today? I'm great, man. I need to borrow whatever you're having because your energy is like 10 times mine right now. I'm impressed. But, uh, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you for the great intro. Thank you so much, buddy. To be honest, it just lasts for like half an hour and then I'm going to pa pass out on the side. <laughs> yeah, half hour is, is great, man. I might get, you might get five minutes of that energy for me and then my kids suck the rest of it out of me for the rest of the day. Awesome. Scott, you know, you have an incredible background. You're a cool dude, but you also have a cool story. And uh, it's really admirable, you know, someone going from a, becoming a DJ to a famous trader and podcaster. Do you mind telling us a little bit about this transition? Because it doesn't sound like the ordinary path. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've always been one who sort of just goes very aggressively after things. And I sort of become like, I wouldn't, I maybe have an addictive personality when I get really, really excited about something. So for me, that was music for 20 years, you know, and I was the dude who was like, would wake up in the middle of the night after sleeping for two hours because I had some random beat in my head and I would run to the studio and, and, and make it and come back. And, you know, it's just, I, I'm kind of crazy in that manner. And, uh, you know, when I had kids and I got a bit older and DJing sort of started to become uh, more of a grind and less of a passion. Uh, and same with producing music, to be honest. And at the same time, you know, I'd always been trading, but I really started to get into crypto and I started falling, you know, just down the bottomless hit like everyone else I think and so I just it wasn't a uh, contrived or planned thing at all you know it was like I'd had this amazing music career and one day I just like the switch went off and I didn't care anymore and I know that sounds nuts you know um, but uh, it's really true and all of a sudden all I cared about was trading and crypto and I started talking about that on Twitter and alienated all the people who have been following me for so long for music <laughs> probably like, what the hell is this guy doing, right? Um, and then, you know, I think I just dove head head on into it and just, you know, got better and better and better at it and started engaging with more people and becoming a part of the community. And it sort of snowballed from there. But like I said, it was never a planned thing. Like in another year, I could completely switch gears and go like become a airbrusher at the mall or something. I don't know, you know, whatever becomes my next passion is the thing that I'll likely dive into and uh and go for that. But for now, man, I, I just love this space. I love trading. I love talking about it. It annoys the shit out of everyone in my life who's not passionate about it because I'm that guy, you know. <laughs> buy Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, very aggressive. And so, uh, you know, they hated me uh, two years ago, but they love me now, you know. Um, and that's really, that's really the story, man. You know, there's a lot more to it and a lot of twists and turns and and, uh, you know, successes and failures in various places because it's kind of an ADD case who just goes after random things. But uh, that's really how I ended up here at this point. I have massive ADD myself, by the way, just to let you know. <laughs> yeah, it's good. 
I kind of, you know, I find when you get older, it becomes less of an impediment and more, I kind of joke that it's sort of a superpower. Like once you harness it, it becomes like I can do more in a day than most people I know can do in a month. You know, as long as I can like do one of those things at a time instead of 15. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny because actually uh, Chris from MM Crypto and also the moon Carl, they also have pretty strong levels of ADD. Uh, which is very interesting because like you said, there is a lack of focus, but sometimes obsession with some certain things, which is very fascinating. But I'd love to ask you, you just mentioned failures and I'm going to put you on the spot, Scott, you know, but everyone, nobody's perfect, right? Uh, no, there's no Superman. There's always a kryptonite with a Superman. And I'd love to know in terms of trading, when you're transitioning from being a DJ to a full-time trader, like were there any big mistakes and lessons learned from trading, you know, throughout your career that you just took away and thought, you know, this was a big mistake, but, you know, I learned this lesson or, or this idea or philosophy behind it? We could do a 25-hour <laughs> podcast on my mistakes and only get to like 2004, honestly. And I think that part of the reason that like uh, people engage with me is because I'm very open about my bad trades, my mistakes, the errors I've made, and I'm very passionate about trying to help people avoid some of those huge pitfalls that I've like gone headfirst into in the past, you know? Um, first I can say that, you know, I went broke so many times trading and investing before I even got to crypto that it's almost comical that I'm still walking. Um, you know, I've, I've made every classic mistake. I've FOMO'd into things, bought the top, sold the bottom. I went all in on a, you know, stock tip in 2012 and literally watched it go to zero. Like, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. I had no business spending on a pharmaceutical stock that literally, like I bought at $6 a share and I sold at one penny a share when it got delisted. You know, I mean, I've really, I've, I've been abused by the market, you know, and I think you just get to a certain point where losing sucks so much that you improve, you know, and it's like, you, you can't trust a, a skinny chef, you know, you can't trust a trader who hasn't gone broke at least once or twice and blown up their account, you know, but the thing transitioning compounds those errors and emotional decisions and bad decisions with becoming a quote unquote full-time trader because what is a full-time trader really like i can't trade full-time i can trade 20 minutes a day and that's enough right i see what i want to see on the chart i take my position and if i'm smart i walk away so the problem is when you become a full-time trader and commit to it is you feel like you need to be in the market all the time and you feel like you always need to be trading because like what am I doing if I'm not like working my ass off? But the reality is once you get to a certain point, there's not that much work to do. You know, you see what you want to see, you know, your plan, you're able to, you have a strategy in place and you execute it and you're actually going to just screw yourself if you sit around and watch it, right? Like you're going to make an emotional decision, take profit too early, move your stop loss down, you know, panic, do all these things because you're not following your plan. So I think once you get to a certain point where you know what your plan is, you see what you want to see on a the chart, there's very little to do as a, quote, pro trader. So I would say I pushed way too hard at the beginning, traded way too much, didn't really understand the tax implications of doing so in the United States, which is like just a utter and disastrous train wreck. Um, and so I would say, you know, I've made, I mean, I'm like a walking textbook of, things you shouldn't do trading over the past 20 something years, you know, and I think that anyone who's been doing it for long enough probably has all of those stories and bad experiences under their belt. But now, you know, the last few years have been, they've made up for it on many, many multiples, anything I've lost. So it's, it's been great. That's great, you know, and I'm a huge fan of the UFC and I love boxing as well. And usually the champions are the ones who've lost, you know, and then come back and actually won after and learning from their losses and discovering themselves. So I think, and, and by the way, there's so many interesting kind of golden rules that you mentioned in that specific answer. And just to go over a few, yeah, in terms of don'ts, you mentioned don't FUD or don't FOMO, don't be emotional. Are those some of the biggest don'ts when it comes to trading mistakes for beginners? Yeah, I mean, I, so like I started a newsletter last year and it was just because like uh, I felt Twitter was too short form and I just had more ideas and wanted to write them out longer. And I find myself almost when I write the intro to almost every single one just talking about trading psychology and emotions, because in my experience, that's the whole ballgame. And even when you talk about technical analysis and strategies and all these things, all you're looking at on a chart is a visualization of people's emotions when they're feeling fearful, when they're feeling greedy, and how you should trade based on that. I mean, that's really, I think, what you're looking at. So as you said, I think that is literally the whole ballgame, right? So the lessons that you learn to become a good trader are more about how to not be stressed, 
what, how to have balance in your life, what things you need to do so that you aren't over trading or so you aren't making bad decisions 22 hours into a trading session that should have been six hours long. How you, in this market in particular, how do you ever turn it off? It's 24 seven. When I was trading stocks, it was easy. No matter how shitty the day was or how bad my trades were, there were no more trades to be had once, you know, uh, the evening hit and the weekend was over and it was off. You don't get weekends off in crypto. You don't get any of it. So you have to force it. And so I think that having balance in your life and having, I guess, a bit of self-awareness, which probably comes with age. I'm very impressed when I see younger traders who really can stick to a well-defined system and, and manage their risk because I was just too much of a gambler and like unsteady, unstable human being to do that effectively, you know, even well into my 30s. I'm 43 now. So now I'm to the point where, and it's a double-edged sword. So I'm to the point where I'm completely emotionalist about trading, right? Like I care more, I joke about this, but I care more if I lose a fantasy football game that has no money on the line than I do if I lose 10 grand on a trade. Like it just doesn't, money and trades do not affect me in any way. The flip side of that is I get no enjoyment out of games, right? Um, which used to be like, you know, this amazing euphoric feeling when you would make a ton of money. Now it's just, to me, it's like I'm moving units around, you know, and I just want to have more of them than I had when I started. So, um, and to be honest, like I'm way more passionate about all the other things in my life than I am about trading. I view trading sort of like as the job. I, I don't think it's like a huge net positive for society. Like, uh, you know, I really want to have an impact on the world. I've just always been that kind of person. I want to be remembered. I don't know if that's an egotistical thing or just the nature, but I, I want to help people. And by and large, showing people your trades or teaching them or, or trying to like, uh, you know, tell them what you're doing probably hurts them more than it helps them because they don't learn their own system of trading. And most traders just lose money. You can't copy someone. You can't, you can copy their lines of the chart, but you can't copy their trade management or their emotions that they have or lack thereof during a trade. So, you know, I, I like, as I said, sort of when I'm thinking about education or talking to people, I like to focus more on bettering them as people to make them better traders than I do on teaching them, you know, indicators and, and strategies. Because at the end of the day, if you have too much emotion, you're just going to blow it no matter what strategy or lines you draw on the chart. Fantastic. So it sounds like you're saying don't FOMO, don't FUD, be logical, yeah. stick to your strategy, stick to your plan. Those seem like a few of your golden rules, are they? Yeah, yeah. And don't. And another huge one that's a huge problem is this, in this market, it's, all, it's a problem in every market, but is that you should never compare what you're trading to the other assets that are out there. They're irrelevant, right? Especially you see now, like, I don't even know how to pronounce it, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, you know, like you're in finance. All these DeFi coins, 40, 50, 60 Xs, makes you feel like you need to jump in. That's the FOMO thing, which may, listen, that may be massively profitable for you to do so. But, you know, you should be happy with any gain that you make. If I make 10% on a coin, it's not relevant to me that somebody else made, you know, 500%, right? And, and it's very hard in this market, especially when you have an active social media community and you can see, the gains that people are making, whether true or not, you know, certainly how they're tweeting, it makes you just feel this, like you're inadequate or whatever you're trading isn't enough. And, you know, if you, I think I'm just very fortunate. I came from a background of trading that wasn't crypto centric. And like, if I did 10% in a year, it was amazing. Now I can do 10% in three minutes, you know? So like, I still have an appreciation for those small gains, you know, so I think they're the key hitting tons of base hits and then maybe once a year you hit that grand slam and make your year, you know. But yeah, I would say exactly what you said. Just don't be emotional about it. Do not fall into the FUD and FOMO. You need to really just like eliminate all the noise, stick to your own guns, stick to your strategy and, and be happy with what you do. Because let's remember, I mean, 95% of traders are failing, right? So if you're making money, even if it's 1%, you're kind of killing it. Yeah, that's that's a really good example, by the way, Scott. I think the Wi-Fi, and I'd love to ask you a follow-up question on that because a lot of people are telling me, hey, you know, uh, look at all these guys making all the, this the, these capital gains, all this upside, et cetera, et cetera. But I usually tell them, I said, yeah, but if you enter now, you're going to be buying the news rather than the rumor. So you want to look at those that are not getting hyped up yet who are kind of flat and have less interest to catch them when they go on an upside. It, is, does that make sense to you? First of all, I'll ask you about yeah. Wi-Fi later, but what is your overall yeah. opinion on that? So like, 
you know, I was late to the game as I always am because I'm just older, slower, and I'm not as technologically savvy, but like to yield farming, I was one of the ones who sort of kind of giggled at it at the beginning and it's a bubble and it's this and that. So I was a bit late to Uniswap and all those things. My approach to trading anything on Uniswap because I'm a trader and I practice risk management is like, okay, there's no stop loss on this platform, right? So my entire, and then let's say I want to risk 2% of my portfolio on any trade. That's my downside risk. So that could mean a huge trade on an altcoin where there's a stop loss because you're not going to zero. I account for literally zero being my stop loss when I now calculate a port, uh, position size on Uniswap or any of these. So uh, like for me, relative to anything else I'm trading, these positions are tiny, right? Because it's, it's a co complete loss would be basically where I'd put my stop loss as opposed to just, you know, that, that slight drawdown. And I think that that's how people need to approach it since you can't practice any risk management. Also, I mean, I'm a technical analyst. These things don't have charts. You can't draw a chart of Wi-Fi. It looks like a, a straight up line. You know what I mean? It's a ladder. It's <laughs> so like, yeah, good luck finding a place where there's a logical pullback or any of these things. So, so I just say, be really, really careful. You know, be really, really careful. This could keep going. I mean, this could be the very, very first inklings of yield farming and DeFi for all I know, but it could also be a complete bubble and could be over. So all you can do is just approach it as you would anything else with a lot of skepticism and just being very careful. Golden tips right there. That was so well put, Scott. And, you know, as we say, whatever comes up really fast usually comes back down really fast. And, you know, I was having drinks with someone here in London the other day who's really into this yield farming thing as well. And he said it's it's going to be dirty. It's going to look really bad. There, Some people are going to get really, really hurt uh, with when it comes to yield farming and things like that. Do you see a Wi-Fi and some other of these tokens going to zero or having a similar kind of outcome than a YAM did? We've already seen some of them going to zero, right? So, yeah. I'm not saying Wi-Fi specifically. I think that they have a really interesting value proposition. I think the ability to like earn yield at that level on locked Ethereum is extremely bullish and novel, and it's deflationary. You know, and and it's only thirty thousand tokens. They're not printing it endlessly. So that one may be an exception. There may be a very good justification. It could go to a million dollars for all I know, but I don't know, right? And I'm not going to approach it with that kind of thing in mind. But I think that like, let me just put it this way. It would be a tremendous deviation from history of any market in any situation where there was this kind of hype for more than one to 2% of these things to succeed in the end, right? So you got to figure that most of these small projects, as always happens, you know, the rich person gets out on top and everybody else gets left holding the bag. The question is, where's the top? Right. I mean, are we early or are these all becoming bag holders already? And that's the very hard part to, to determine. So that's why I say allocate your, uh, your you know, allocate your uh, money wisely and, and don't get too heavily into it. I know most people who are doing this are young and they're pretty much all in. Right. And that's a scary. They may do. They may become billionaires for all I know, but it's very scary. So, Scott, I'd love to ask you on how you allocate funds for trading the more risky assets. So, let's say the nano cap or some of the micro caps that are starting to emerge but don't really have token utility or strong tokenomics. How much, what is the percentage that you put in speculating? So, personally, for myself, I invest 80% most of the time. I might swing trade, but I like to use 20% max in speculating. Do you have any rules on the percentages and the ratios that you put in different assets? Yeah, very much so. And it's kind of funny because I'm a quote unquote professional trader, but it would be a bit more accurate to say that I'm a professional investor because I've always believed in sort of the classical, um, you know, allocation of portfolio, which is 70% investments, long term holds, 15% uh, cash and 15% for trading. So that way, if you're a complete jackass, you know, you only are putting 15% uh, at risk, really. So and, and that's within each of my portfolios. So that's within my stock portfolio. Forex portfolio, metals portfolio, and crypto portfolio. And, you know, until recently, I believed that you should only have about 10% of your money in crypto maximum. I think that, you know, most people my age probably think that's high, but I think that most people younger think that that's very low. Um, and so that has swelled tremendously for me, and I have not reallocated. So it's much larger than that for me now, uh, mostly because I don't like what's happening in the world, and I really have come to believe that this is a hedge and, and it's just very important to, to hold it. But yes, in general, I think you should be trading and speculating with a very small part of your portfolio. 
Most people who have gotten rich over time in markets have never looked at a chart. They don't even know technical analysis exists. They've probably never made a trade. What they've done is that early in their life, they've put money away and they've had the, you know, discipline to not touch it. And then they've touched it when they were older and they've gotten rich. Markets rise. So you're getting in your own way doing that. And most traders find, if you actually do an analysis, that even if they're making money, they probably would have been better just like sitting in an ETF or some sort of a mutual fund. You know, you think you're making money, but you're not making as much money as when you do nothing. So it seems like you're banging your head against the wall doing all this work, and all you have to do is just have some financial discipline and put your money in the market. I really like that, Scott. So 70% for investing, 15% in cash, and 15% for trading. That makes a lot of sense because some technical analysts, they overly rely on technicals, you know? Like everything is based on a chart and there's a little, just, just a little bit of focus on fundamentals. Like, is that what you're doing at the moment? So you're investing in the crypto assets that have stronger fundamentals? Well, when I say long-term investment and hold, the extreme bulk of that is Bitcoin and Ethereum for me. You know, um, it's uh, kind of like just that's how I, you know, coming from the uh, from the stock market, it's like buying spy to me, you know, like having just an index that tracks the market as a whole because the market's going to rise. And I believe that. And so the core of my strategy is dollar cost averaging. And because and what people don't realize, yeah, I bought Bitcoin at like eighteen thousand dollars, but I also bought it over and over again at like eighteen hundred dollars. Right. And. When you look at the chart, Bitcoin has spent so little time above where we are now that you're wildly in profit if you've just blindly bought. I'm talking about like hundreds of percents in profit if you've been dollar cost averaging for the last three years. Ethereum as well. Listen, there's projects that I just absolutely love. Like I have a bad habit of having people on my podcast and then be going down their rabbit hole and becoming very passionate about their projects and then like keeping in touch with them afterwards and being the annoying guy who's like asking questions. But um so, you know, there are projects that I've moved like, or, you know, that I've moved some into that longer term bag, but it's very small percentages. And also like, I'm a firm believer that if the market, like if you do exceptionally well on an asset, do a 10X, 11X, something crazy, even 2X, 3X, like you should keep 10% of your bag and just move it to the long-term holdings and just see what happens, right? Because you're playing with the casino's money. So like if that thing does another 100X, it won't even matter that you sold most of it. So. I have like all these sort of like dust, you know, investments that are, you know, 10% of a once great trade that are sitting around uh, waiting. And some of those have become absolutely huge, you know, holding. But yes, in general, invest in the stuff you're passionate about and uh, wait, you'll probably do a lot better. That sounds really good. And by, by the way, I'm really honored, Scott, that I choose 20% and you have 15% because I'm following a pro right now. So <laughs> it's a little bit of validation for myself. So I'm glad to hear I, that. <laughs> I, I will say, though, as a part of that, it's funny, but a part of risk management is not like everyone thinks of risk management is like, I'll just risk 1% on a trade or 2% on a trade. One of the least talked about parts of risk management for me is knowing when to go heavily in the market and when to be on the sidelines. So I can tell you that this year, when it's been going crazy, I was up to like two months ago, I was up to about 60% alt exposure from 15%, you know, for, for trading. And it was incredible and amazing. But the minute Bitcoin started moving again, I just like exited and, and got back to my normal allocation. So I don't want to pretend like I never get beyond that 15%, but I like to keep it as a standard. There are, but in the last three years, there's been, you know, less than you can count on a single hand times that I've gone above 25, 30% alt exposure or trading exposure, you know, so. And I think you just mentioned something really cool, another golden rule, which is like taking profits, right? When your corner token goes 5x, 10x, like... Uh, how do you feel about this, Scott? Like for me, like the more speculative, the micro cap, more little bit, not a little bit, actually quite risky assets. When they go five to ten x, I like to take out my initial investment and then just reinvest all the the capital gains, so that if it goes to zero, I haven't lost any money. Yeah. Is that a good strategy, or what's your take on that? That's a great. That's a great strategy. I'm a huge fan. I never buy and sell generally in one shot. Right. I mean. Like I, if I'm doing it on a chart, I take, you know, 15% profit here, 15% profit here, 15% profit. And it's just scaling out on the way up. That way you don't miss out on a huge move. If it happens, like I said, you might have that little bit left, but you also aren't the jackass who like hits your stop loss after going 3x, right? Um, 
I also have always been a fail, fan of trailing stops in at least certainly in traditional markets where like, you know, move move your stop up to your entry, move your stop up into profit, move your stop up further into profit just at each logical level. But yes, I mean, it goes back to sort of the tax thing, which in the United States is horrible. Like I like to basically get the tax portion of the gains out and into dollars and into a bank account because like I've been there where I had to sell a whole lot of stuff I didn't want to sell at a certain time just to you know, account for the, the tax liability and things like that. So I think what you're saying is definitely true. If the casino gives you the chance to like take your initial investment out and play with the house money, like I mentioned before, that's that's where you want to be, right? As long as you don't uh, lose all that and then dip back into your pocket at the ATM. So I think that your approach is very wise. And, uh, you know, I would just add to that for me that I just start taking profit very early. You know, I'm never the guy who does like the hundred X on the whole position. It never happens. I'm usually taking profit already at 10, 20%, you know, just cause like I, I hate losing money that I have gained. It's just, I do not want to be that guy. That's the worst feeling there is in trading. I think. Awesome. Extra validation from a professional trader. <laughs> <Woo-hoo>! <laughs> so, and you, you mentioned dollar cost averaging, uh, Scott, this is a really like highly recommended thing for anyone who wants to get into Bitcoin, but not many people actually understand what it means. If you don't mind, Scott, like if my grandma Susie was watching the show, like how would you, explain- Hi, grandma Susie, <laughs> Hi, grandma Susie. Uh, how would you explain dollar cost averaging when getting into Bitcoin, for instance, or Ethereum? Well, it's very simple. So most people, when they especially, I mean, in general, that's how I approach markets anyways. But if you want to get into a speculative asset, it's a lot less intimidating to do it slowly than it is to just take a huge chunk of your money by the market price and and pray, right? Interestingly, in the stock market, if you go back through time, statistically, you are actually better off buying all at once. Um, But there are a few times in history where people go broke doing that. So it's not as safe, but it's statistically you'll probably make more money, but your downside, if you're wrong on timing is extreme. Like if in 2000, you know, seven, you uh, took all your money and put it in the stock market. That, that was not very good because you didn't have any money left to buy the dips as the recession went on. So if I was explaining it to your grandmother or someone else, I would say, Hey, listen, you want to put 10 grand into Bitcoin? buy $500 a month for the next 20 months or $500 a week for the next 20 weeks because this market moves so fast. You know what I mean? But don't do it all at once. You'll feel much more comfortable seeing it go in slowly and do it, you know, price agnostic, do it blind, set it on some sort of, you know, set it and forget it on a platform to automatically buy Monday morning at nine o'clock, you know, buy your $500 worth and call it a day because uh, I mean, you know, that's how most people handle their IRAs. That's how most people, handle their investments. And the reality is that 99.9% of people don't really know how to trade and invest, right? They're just trying to get their money in and it's a much more uh, emotionless way to to do it. You know, listen, you may feel like you you may be the one who's like, I could have bought $10,000 of it yesterday and tomorrow it's up 30% and never comes back down. But like, if you play the odds, you know, you're going to be buying dips and and the thing is, you know, you're buying more when it dips and less when it's up. Dollar cost averaging, man, it's as simple as it gets. There's so many ways to do it. There's so many cool ways to do it. And I mean, unless you're in a full on tulip bubble, like in any rising market, which markets always rise over time, it's never been a bad strategy for anyone. That's such good advice. And, you know, for all the people who are afraid to get into it, it's really in the reason why I'm asking you this question, Scott, is because some of my friends are like, no, I'm going to wait till it crashes again. And before, you know, buying some Bitcoin, but I'm saying, yeah, but that's yeah. cool. But you, you don't know if it's going to consolidate because there are many problems in the world, macro problems that m- may actually drive a, a bull run for, for Bitcoin. Maybe some people talk about presidential yeah. elections and stuff like that. But I guess, you know, dollar cost averaging is the wiser way to start, isn't it? Yeah, that's if it dips, right? When it dips, when it dips is, first of all, like I'm going to sell now to buy back lower is like the most, one of the most dangerous concepts in trading. The entire reason that markets go FOMO and rise is because people who think they were going to buy cheaper end up buying more expensive. That's what fuels FOMO rallies. Your friends are going to buy at 25000 That's the reality. And, and, and every day that it rises, they're going to be more and more and more afraid to buy until they buy the dead ass top. That's how trading works. That's why people get rich. That's why Buffett makes comments like, you know, that the market is a mechanism for transferring wealth from the patient, from the impatient to the patient. 
believing you can predict the future and time it properly is just a fallacy and it's, it's a losing game, right? That's why you dollar cost average with most of your investment and then you trade with a small part of your, of your portfolio. Beautifully said, Scott. And one last question. I promise I won't bother you anymore. You know, (laughs) recently, like, you know, in terms of Bitcoin's bullishness, you know, a lot of people are talking about how Warren Buffett, which you just mentioned right now, is kind of allocating, selling a lot of his U.S. dollar, buying some Japanese stocks, but also putting a lot of money into gold. Uh, Is this, you know, due to the current quantitative easing and the possible debasement of the U.S. dollar, the the euro and the British pound, is this the most bullish scenario for Bitcoin in the future? So there's two things to parse there. Yes to your second question. I think that if Bitcoin ever, if its narrative was ever coming true, we're we're witnessing it, right? Uh, Quantitative easing, infinite money printing. That said, I don't believe the dollar is going to hyperinflate like the Venezuelan Bolivar and become, I don't think the dollar is, you know, we're going to need two cases of it to buy bread. That's not a future that I think is going to happen. And frankly, it's not a future I want to live in. So I hope that something like that doesn't happen. But, you know, we'll see micro versions of that. Um, so, yes, I mean, I think that uh, Bitcoin is behaving like a store of value, like digital gold. I don't think it's correlated to them necessarily. I think more if you want to talk correlation, it's very clear. If you look at the two charts, the DXY, the dollar index moves inversely to Bitcoin and to all these other assets. Dollar weakness means Bitcoin strength to, to a very strong degree. But talking about Warren Buffett. If I believed he was really buying gold and trying to get uh, off of the dollar, I would say yes, but that's just not the reality of what happened. That's the way it's being portrayed by the media. But what Warren Buffett did was he bought stock in a gold miner that pays a really nice dividend and yield, right? So Warren Buffett hates gold. He always has. He just is a guy who loves yield, right? He loves a dividend. He loves to know he's going to get a few percent back on his investment while watching that investment rise. It's very smart. And he knows that there's hype around gold and stuff. So he bought a miner rather than buying gold. So he's not buying gold, right? He's buying a company that mines gold that has yield and gives him a dividend. So I just think that that's misleading. That said, he would have never, ever, 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 ever done that before. So like if you want to take the narrative part that he would even be willing to look to something that has gold exposure, yes, I think that that's that's huge. But you just saw these headlines for a week that was like Warren Buffett bearish on on you know on the dollar buying gold it's just not true right it's just not what happened so but if you want to talk about the macro narrative man i really thought you know as much as i believe in crypto and as amazing as it is i never wanted to have more than 10 percent of my money in it because i can't pay my kids private school tuition in it and i can't buy gas with it and you know what i mean like i can't pay my mortgage with it and so but now my my over I think my overarching view on money and on crypto is that dollars are for spending and Bitcoin is for saving. Yeah. And like uh, like a dollar is not a savings account anymore. When I was a kid, you could get plus you know over ten percent in a savings account on your dollars. Put a dollar in a savings account, it'd be a dollar and ten cents a year later. It's amazing, right? Now you get less than one percent. That's you know. So I would rather have my savings to a large degree in cold storage or, you know, partially on a platform gaining some yield, some interest rates, um, but, and save that for my kids, you know, not save the useless dollars, but so spend your dollars and save your crypto, you know, and, uh, and keep your normal exposure to other assets and you'll be fine. Hopefully <laughs> if you won't be fine, then I'm, I won't be fine. So <laughs> thanks for, thanks so much for, for actually telling us that that was fake news. I didn't know that. And it's great to know that, you know, people are, the media is kind of stretching the truth as usual to make it's things. It's not fake. It's just, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a stretched. different take on the narrative. I just view it as very inaccurate because if you read those headlines, you thought that he like was like Scrooge mixed up yeah, yeah, in exactly. dovetail, diving, <laughs> diving into his, you know, his, uh, his, huge safe full of gold and the reality is he like bought shares in a company that uh, pay him back you know tremendously yeah but I think you just gave a really good golden tip there as well by saying you know spend the soft money save the hard money we've had other people on the show uh, ex- share the exact same message right you know Bitcoin is a store of value US dollar for consumerism so that makes a lot a lot of sense and sorry one last question scott and i promise i'll let no, you go I got all day, man. We're good. <laughs> sorry go it's always last want. question last question with me it doesn't end up being the no, last it's question really fine. <laughs> Seriously. 
So uh, in terms of technical indicators, I'd love to know, you know, I know that you use uh, support, key support, key resistance for your trades. Are there any other indicators that you specifically like to use when uh, trading crypto, Fibonacci levels, moving averages, or any things that seem to work for, for you when trading? It's, it's so funny because I, I spoke at World CryptoCon last year in October, uh-huh. and it was like a huge traders convention, and I gave this like epic talk on like why you're an idiot for trading and like we're all degenerates, basically. And people were like, what's this guy doing up here? But And I started the whole thing as if I was Alcoholics Anonymous, but it was Traders Anonymous. And I literally went through, I was like, I've been a Ichimoku crowd, cloud maximalist. I've been support and resistance, supply and demand, OBV, RSI, maxi. If you've been trading for a long time, you, you've probably tried every single indicator, right? And what I find with uh, advanced traders is that eventually you simplify everything to the point where you don't need any of it, which is funny because you realize that like a chart is just there for a way to justify a position and a stop loss. A chart is a risk management tool. It's not a crystal ball, right? So like all this is just more noise and more data and none of it ends up helping. So you do it all, you try it all. My charts three or four years ago, sometimes would have like 50 things happening and it looked like I was at like a Pink Floyd laser light show or something. Um, and the reality is like price action, volume, simple supply, you know, support uh, and resistance levels, where you think there's liquidity, right? Supply and demand. And then the one indicator that I always come back to just because I love it is RSI and I use it strictly for finding divergences between RSI and price because I find them to be great bottom and top signals or, or reversing signals. But beyond that, like I'll check in on them every once in a while, kind of for a laugh or to look for confluence, but like I've rinsed them all, you know, and uh, at the end of the day, like I just want to know where to put a stop loss and how big for my position size to be. And that's the only reason you need a chart, you know, so. It's funny, Scott, because, you know, like when we try to improve ourselves, I'm a huge fan of uh, personal development and, you know, help self-help books. And a lot of them you just keep on reading, keep on reading, keep on reading, keep on testing. But at the end of the actual, the lesson that you learn is usually very simple. It seems like the same thing, right? We start simply, then we go into the very complex, but making mistakes in the complex makes us realize that the simple way is the right way very often. No? Yeah, you talk about self-help books. I mean, you, like you said, if you read them all and try to practice everything, you'll spend 24 hours you know, a day practicing the tips that are in those self-help books. And it's the same with traders, like you said. If you want a self-help book, here you go. Don't give a shit what anyone else says about you and you know, be confident and love yourself. There's your self-help, right? And so it's very simple. And everything in every self-help book I've ever read basically in some way boils down to that very simple concept, which is like, don't, you know, worry about the opinions of others. Don't worry about other things. Be confident in yourself. Learn to know yourself and accept yourself for who you are. Once you can do that, that'll help your trading tremendously too. Because like I said, you can look at Twitter and you can see all these gains and all these things people are doing and you start to feel inferior and whatever. And the reality is like, all you can do is like be your best self and, you know, eliminate the negativity and try to focus on the positive things. And if you can do that, you're just like life becomes so much fun and, and so easy. Um, it, it sounds so ridiculous, but it is just like trading. Like you said, once you eliminate all the bullshit, it becomes very, very simple. It's like seeing the matrix, you know. You guys have heard it from Scott Melker. You hear today so many golden rules and tips, all the do's and don'ts for trading, an amazing story behind this gentleman. And Scott, obviously we know that you're very active on Twitter. So if people want to follow you, it's simply at Scott Melker, M-E-L-K-E-R, Wolf of All Streets. Anything else that you'd like to share with the community today? Nah, man, I just appreciate, honestly, I like, I wake up every day and pinch myself that I get to do this every day you know like all i i really just am so passionate about mainstream adoption and just getting the word out like i said i'm the annoying little gnat who's just poking everyone in my life and trying to tell them and podcast newsletter twitter all these things they're just ways for me to hopefully help some people and and get the get the story out there you know so i i really if i want to say anything to everyone is that i appreciate that even one person bothers to follow me and, and pay attention to what i'm doing and i take that you know responsibility very seriously so thank you
And I would just love to validate that, Scott, because, you know, a lot of the people that I really respect here in the UK and even in New York have said many good things about you, uh, despite the amount of followers and uh, telling that you're a genuine guy on top of being a great trader. So thank you so much. We'll put all of your information in the box below. And guys, don't forget to join us every Wednesday, premiering at a PC near you, 8 o'clock BST. Thank you so much for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, and blast that bell notification. And we will see you next Wednesday, premiering at a PC New You. Thanks so much, guys. See you next week.